Welcome to Baraboo 101 Part 3, From Railroad to Ringling. If you missed Baraboo 101 Parts 1 or 2, you can find them at the YouTube channel for the Sauk County Historical Society. Would you please subscribe? You'll be informed of all new posts of videos. You can also find lots of great local history content at our website, SaukCountyHistory.org. Be sure to click on the Education tab and find all of the great resources available for students and adults alike. Are you receiving the twice-monthly email newsletter from the Sauk County Historical Society? If not, please subscribe at our website. You can also find us on Facebook and join nearly 3,000 people that are receiving local posts on history and news on upcoming events. We'll begin with a recap of Baraboo 101 Part 2 where we learn that Euro-American settlement started here on this stretch of the river in late 1839. The potential for water power, coupled with the abundant forests, were the calling card. Three locations for dams were initially started, one at each oxbow and one between them. A dam and sawmill at the upper oxbow were the first to be completed, and lumber continued to be a big business in Baraboo for many years. In 1847, two villages named Adams and Baraboo were platted next to each other along the Baraboo River. The village of Adams was platted by Sauk County government as the new county seat after it was decided to move the county seat from Prairie to Sac. Baraboo was platted by George Brown around his dam and mill. The two plats would later be combined and known as Baraboo. Early settlers were mainly Yankees from the eastern United States. They brought with them their methods of government, education, religion, and style. Many early buildings were built in the popular Greek Revival style, including this building from downtown Baraboo, which still exists and is one of the oldest buildings in the city. Industry flourished with the help of the water power of the river. Added to the sawmills were grist mills and flour mills, woolen mills, foundries, furniture factories, and other businesses, all using the water power from the river. In 1855, Sauk County started construction on the first brick courthouse, which would be located in the center of the public square. With no railroad, all of the bricks had to be made locally, and it took more than a year and a half to complete the structure. The old wooden courthouse on the north side of the square was later sold and became a tavern. It burned down during the early morning hours of July 5, 1859. The fire took out not only the old courthouse, but six other wooden buildings on the north side of the square. Calls for a hook and ladder company immediately followed this first big fire, which fortunately had destroyed one of the less valuable areas of the square, but still caused over $4,500 worth of damage. In 1860, the Baraboo Hook and Ladder Company No. 1 was formed. The company marched in the 1861 Independence Day Parade. The paper noted their truck was 36 feet long and presented a handsome appearance. The paper went on to say, The uniforms of the company, some 60 in number, gave them a look of efficiency which we hope may never be tried. But if it should be, we trust and believe it will be sustained by their actions. Just a few years earlier, in 1857, the Sauk County Bank was started in a wooden building on the south side of the square. One of the co-founders of the bank was Terrell Thomas, who had this house erected in the fashionable Gothic Revival style in 1860. The house still stands and is known as the House of Seven Gables. Not long after the Thomases moved into their new house on the edge of the village, News made it to Baraboo by telegraph that a civil war had started. 
The war would change not only Baraboo's history, but of course that of the entire country. Once calls were made for recruits, Baraboo and the rest of Sauk County rallied to the cause. The Baraboo Republic of April 25th, 1861 described the events at the time. The events of the last few days in this village will never fade from the memories of those who witnessed or bore part in them. On Friday, Mr. Nash of the Madison Guards arrived here after enlisting 14 names in Sauk City and Prairie de Sac, 12 Germans and two Americans. Forthwith, recruits began to fall in and the martial sound of drum and fife, unheard in our streets this many a day, inspired all hearts with patriotic enthusiasm. Among the Baraboo volunteers to the Madison Guards were two sons of a lady who depended upon them and one other for her support. She gave the other permission to go also when he should have replenished her woodpile. On Saturday, they were initiated into military drill by A.G. Malloy, also a volunteer, who had served in the Mexican War. In the evening, a meeting was held to organize a home company to offer themselves to the governor in the service of the Union. On the Sabbath morning, the strange sound of the drum by the expert hand of Reverend W.H. Thompson to the tune of Yankee Doodle announced that the volunteers were about to leave. A very large concourse of citizens met in front of the courthouse to do honor to the noble hearts that so promptly responded to their country's call. Reverend C. E. Wyrick, by invitation, acted as chaplain and delivered an address eminently appropriate to the occasion. A national hymn was then sung, and after the benediction, the friends of those about to encounter the dangers and hardships of war were invited to bid them adieu. During the exercises, many eyes were moist, but at this juncture, every face was wet with tears. Men whom we had never suspected could be touched with tenderness, stood with flowing eyes as sisters, mothers, and wives came up to give the parting kiss. After taking their seats in the wagon, E. N. Marsh, in behalf of the volunteers, made a brief but touching address to those assembled. At half past nine, with flying colors and to the sound of the drum and fife, under a banner inscribed on one side, the Union Forever, and on the other, Beru volunteers to the Madison Guards, they drove out of town, followed by a procession of wagons and numerous friends on foot. These 12 volunteers were enrolled among the Madison Guards and left Madison for Milwaukee. They have unanimously resolved not to taste a drop of liquor until they get back to Baraboo. The particulars of the organization of the home company was also reported in the newspaper. At the Methodist Church that morning, after the departure of the guards, Mr. Wyrick spoke upon the duty of maintaining the government, and the impression made will never be effaced from the minds of those who heard him. On Monday, the recruiting continued, and at night, with no call but that of the drum, there was a spontaneous gathering of the ladies, as well as of the more warlike sex. The courthouse was fairly jammed, and the feeling was such that one might put out his hand and almost feel the electricity in the air. The recruits started for Reedsburg to enlist accessions to their ranks. Arrived at Reedsburg, the Sauk County Riflemen, for such was the name by which these first recruits were known, stopped at the Alba House, where a grand reception awaited them. Speeches were made by prominent citizens, Ten recruits were there enrolled, and the boys returned to their homes to await the call of the governor. From this date forward, a blaze of excitement pervaded Sauk County. Impromptu meetings were held in every village and settlement, at which recruits were raised and funds voted for the relief of those left in dependent condition by the enlistment of fathers, brothers, and husbands. The ladies were notably active in forming societies with relief ends in view and making bandages and picking lint to be used on the field of battle in case any of their dear ones were so unfortunate as to be wounded. The departure for Madison was taken June 25th, the occasion being one long to be remembered by citizens and soldiers alike. In the end, 108 joined the Union Army in June of 1861, and the Sauk County Riflemen became part of Company A of the 6th Wisconsin Infantry. They were mustered in July 16, 1861, at Camp Randall in Madison. Of note, one of the meals provided there was bread, potatoes, codfish gravy, and cold coffee. 
The recruits received uniforms light gray in color, and they did not get blue uniforms for over a year. They left for fighting July 28, 1861, first going to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All in all, Sauk County sent 1,646 men to serve in the Civil War. 285 of them died in battle or more likely from injuries and disease, and they served in all branches of the military and fought in all theaters. Baraboo was quieter during the Civil War, but had grown substantially since its founding in 1847. In 1862, the local paper reported that the community had one bank, three boot and shoe stores, one bakery and confectionery, six blacksmith shops, two cabinet ware rooms, three cooper shops, five dry goods stores, two drug stores, two dentist rooms, one daguerrean gallery, two flouring mills, three grocery stores, one gunsmith shop, two hardware stores, four hotels, one harness shop, one hub factory, one jewelry store, one millinery and bookstore, one music store, two meat markets, one mill for grinding corn, one pump factory, one sash and blind factory, three sawmills, two tailor shops, three wagon shops, one woolen factory, one college, and one female seminary. In 1863, it was reported, it is a perfect New England town, transplanted to a new country with its wide streets shaded by beech, locust, elm, and maple trees, its clean, fresh-looking white-painted homes embowered in shrubbery, roses, and trailing vines, its gardens, fruit orchards, pleasant walks, and that general air of refinement denoting a population intelligent, cultivated, and independent. Baraboo, although the shire town of Sauk, one of the oldest and richest farming counties in the state, is more especially noted for its manufacturers, to the development of which it has brought a genuine Yankee skill and perseverance. The beautiful Baraboo River, gracefully winding through the valley, about a stone's throw from the courthouse square, is the Archimedean lever that turns numberless mill wheels and offers a cheap, immense, and exhaustible motive power to future mills and factories that must sooner or later arise upon its banks. The beauty of the scenery in the vicinity, differing from that of other parts of the state in its larger variety, is the universal remark of travelers and tourists. The residents themselves pay but little attention to it and frequently go abroad for a change of scenery. Despite the Civil War, opportunity still existed in Baraboo, especially where relatively cheap water power could still be harnessed. In 1863, the Island Woolen Mill started at the Upper Oxbow, where the water power lay unused for many years. By 1871, the Island Woolen Mill was producing 8 to 10,000 yards of cloth per month, or about 100,000 yards of cloth annually, employing about 36 people. Interesting things also happened during the war years. In 1863, an octagon house, which had been built in Newport in 1855, was moved to Baraboo. The octagon house sat at the corner of 4th Avenue and West Street and for many years it was one of the more prominent homes in town. It was demolished around 1918. After the Civil War ended, life in Baraboo returned to normal and the economy started to pick up. In 1866, Baraboo became a village chartered by state legislature and the first election for village officials occurred on April 2nd, 1867. A severe flood hit the area in April of 1866. The newspaper at the time described the scene at the central mill power. With the breaking up of the jam of ice and drift above Pratt's Dam, some 60 feet of the dam were swept out together with the bulkhead for the new foundry. 
It was at this time the main bridge went out, giving way in a moment before the immense masses of ice which were hurled against it. The scene was one of fearful grandeur and was witnessed by large numbers of our citizens. A faint idea of the immense force with which these fields of ice carried with them may be obtained from the blocks now lodged high and dry on the dam or lining the shores. One of these, some ten or twelve feet square, by two feet thick, we estimated would weigh about two tons. Masses of equal thickness, half acres in extent, hurled with all swiftness of the angry current, went rushing down the stream. A footbridge is being constructed where the main bridge was taken out. This photograph from later in 1866 shows a new bridge being built at the Ash Walnut Street location. Underneath it and just upstream is the footbridge that was installed after the flood took out the main bridge. The footbridge shown here was described in the local paper. The footbridge commenced week before last was last week completed and is a very great convenience. Wide enough to be safe for a person of ordinary nerves, many complain that the rushing water below causes them to grow giddy in crossing. A hand railing would obviate this objection at very trifling expense and should be added at once. The following week, the newspaper reported, Mrs. Stallman, while crossing the footbridge with her little girl on Sunday evening last, became giddy and fell into the river, dragging the child with her. She was promptly rescued. A few days before, a little girl, when about halfway across the bridge, was affected in like manner and threw herself down on the planks and screamed until assistance came to her. We repeat what we said last week, that a hand railing should be put up at once. This view looks northwest from the south side of the river. In the background is the giant Bassett flour mill, and on the ridge above are houses that are now on First Street in Baraboo. This is the same view from a few years ago, and the only thing remaining from the earlier 1866 photograph are a few of the houses on First Street. The Methodists, who had been the first to build a church building in Baraboo, once again enlarged their structure in 1866 by adding a bell tower. Also that year, the Unitarian Congregation built a new church building at the northeast corner of 4th Avenue and Birch Street. Today, this is the location of the Carnegie Shadi Memorial Public Library in Baraboo. At the Upper Oxbow and next door to the Island Woolen Mill, the Baraboo Manufacturing Company was started in 1867. The complex included a factory building, a blacksmith shop, warehouse, paint shop, dry house, steam rooms, sheds, and barns, covering about five acres. Goods produced included tables, chairs, and bedsteads. Beds and tables were about $2.50 a piece. Dining room chairs were about a dollar a piece, and rocking chairs were anywhere from $250 to $350 a piece. Goods were sent as far as Chicago, Texas, and Omaha. Also in 1867, German immigrant George Rulin started Baraboo's first lager brewery on Baraboo's south side at the corner of Walnut and Lynn Streets. This view from that period shows the Bassett Mill. In the foreground along Water Street, behind it is the 1866 Ash Walnut Street Bridge. George Rulin's Brewery can be found here on the south side of Baraboo, and it anchored a commercial district that straddled both sides of the river on either side of the Ash Walnut Street Bridge. Early merchants here capitalized on the Ash Walnut Street bridge crossing, as well as people living on the south side of Baraboo and working in the industry in the area. After 1859, the next major fire on the square occurred in 1867 on the south side, in which several buildings were consumed. 
One of these was the Sauk County Bank, which was in a wooden building, but had decided to build that year anyways on the corner of Oak and Third. A new brick building for the Sauk County Bank was finished in 1867 and was designed by famous Milwaukee architect E. Townsend Mix. The name of the bank was later changed to the Bank of Baraboo for many years, and today it is known as Baraboo State Bank. When the bank building was completed, Sauk County was in the midst of an agricultural boom growing hops. Hops, as an essential ingredient for beer, had been first brought to Sauk County in 1852 by English emigrant Jesse Coddington. Hops were mainly grown in the eastern United States before the Civil War, but the crops were decimated there by the hops louse in the early 1860s. Sauk County farmers quickly saw the potential for huge profits as the price for hops rose every year. By 1867, prices were at their highest, reaching 55 to 70 cents per pound, three to four times higher than in 1861. At the height of the boom, there were as many as 800 hop yards in Sauk County, covering some 1,600 acres. Not only those growing hops could make money on the boom, as hops production required specialty items, including poles for growing the climbing plant and hop stoves for drying out the hops after they were harvested. Harvesting hops was a labor-intensive process that required many people for a short period of time. Some people made money by providing laborers to pick the hops. This often included young ladies. In 1867, roughly 2 million pounds of hops were harvested in Sauk County alone, with prices at an all-time high, well over $1 million in 1867 money was sifting through the local economy. Farmers with as few as seven acres of hops in cultivation could net profits of thousands of dollars. The boom went bust in 1868 when prices plummeted. The hops, louse, had found its way to Sauk County and the eastern crop was recovering. Hops continued to be cultivated in Sauk County though until the early 1900s. This view of the Potter Hop Yard southeast of Baraboo looks to the northwest, showing the hexagonal Sauk County Jail and the 1850s Sauk County Courthouse in the distance. With more money in the local economy, Baraboo got around to building its first brick schoolhouse in 1869 replacing the woefully inadequate 1850 Union Schoolhouse. The new brick schoolhouse was built to accommodate up to 870 students, although when it opened in October of 1870, there were 600 students enrolled. When the new school was finished and opened in 1870, it was the pride of the village for many years. One of its teachers over the years was Belle Case, future wife of Bob La Follette. One of Bell's students was John Ringling, of which she later wrote, when John read a long account, interrupted with giggles from the school, of the side shows he and other boys had been giving every night, I lectured him and drew the moral that if John would put his mind on his lessons as he did on side shows, he might yet become a scholar. Fortunately, the scolding had no effect. Baraboo's brick schoolhouse lasted until 1906 when it was destroyed by fire. One remnant remains, and this is the cast metal date plaque seen here. This heavy metal plaque can be found today on the porch of the Van Orden Mansion, which is the Sauk County Historical Museum in Baraboo. By 1870, Baraboo had a population of just over 1,500 people. That year, this bird's eye map was produced by the firm of Ruger and Stoner out of Madison, Wisconsin. 
It shows the village in its entirety, straddling both sides of the Baraboo River and encompassing one bridge at the Ash Walnut Street location. Surrounding the village were a number of country estates. One of these was built in 1869. It was built for Henry Rich, who was owner of the Island Woolen Mill at that time, and it was on the western edge of the village. Today, the home of Henry Rich still stands on 4th Avenue, just across the street from the Sauk County Historical Museum. The 1870 bird's eye drawing shows downtown Baraboo's public square, surrounded on three sides by largely wooden buildings. On the northeast corner of the square is the Western House, enlarged from its one-story beginning in 1847 to three stories with a cupola on the top. On the north side of the square is the Wisconsin House, originally began in 1850 with a brick portion on the right and enlarged in 1867. As successful as Baraboo had become, its further growth would always be hindered without access to a railroad. The nearest railroads were many miles away, the first in Spring Green crossing in 1855, and one nearby in Kilbourne in 1857. The obstacle to bringing a railroad through Baraboo had always been the terrain. Since being established, attempts to bring a railroad through Baraboo had been tried for many years. Attempts in the 1850s were thwarted by financial panics, land-grant failures, and the crossing of the La Crosse and Milwaukee Railroad at Kilbourne. Attempts in the 1860s were halted by the Civil War. After the war in 1869, Colonel Abelman of Rock Springs wrote and published several articles urging the people of the Baraboo Valley to organize for railroad purposes and laid down a plan of operation. The force with which these letters were written caused an organization to be made which was entitled the Baraboo Airline Railroad Company. The Colonel was chosen as president. The organization soon caught the attention of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, which bought out the rights to the railroad coming through the area. In the spring of 1871, construction began on a railroad line from Madison to Baraboo. This was no small feat in the 38 mile stretch from Madison to Baraboo, more than 2 million cubic yards of material had to be moved. This was more than all the material moved on the 242 mile stretch built from Chicago to Green Bay. Another obstacle to bringing a railroad through the heart of Sauk County was crossing the Wisconsin River. This was done at Merrimack, where a large wooden bridge crossed the river, here shown with the replacement iron bridge many years later. The railroad found its way through the Baraboo Bluffs by coming through the Devil's Lake Gap and following the lake on its eastern shore. The railroad entered the village of Baraboo from the south, and a rail yard was laid out on the south side of the river before the rail continued to the west, heading towards Reedsburg. The first train reached Baraboo on September 12, 1871. Over 10,000 people were on hand for the event, with the festivities compromising two and a half hours of speeches and dedications. The Baraboo newspaper noted, one of the remarkable features of the occasion was the great arch erected over the track. On either side of the track, a circle of hop poles had been formed, through the spaces between the poles, hop vines were wreathed until the poles were entirely clad with green. On the top of the columns rested a broad arch surrounded by a large keystone, upon which were piled immense golden pumpkins, strings of red-cheeked apples, sheaves of wheat, and stalks of corn. In the stenner stood a flagstaff from which floated a banner. 
The arrival of the railroad meant that Baraboo was connected to broader markets, but it was also chosen to be a division headquarters for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. The railroad built facilities and offices in Baraboo for managing hundreds of miles of track, including an eight-stall roundhouse for working on steam locomotives. Other railroad buildings included a wooden depot, a two-story railroad hotel and eating house, and an office building for the division headquarters. Eventually, hundreds of railroad employees lived and worked in Baraboo. These included conductors, firemen, engineers, brakemen, and mechanics. Steam locomotive engineers were some of the highest paid individuals, including men like William Clark, shown here on the left. William Clark used some of his earnings to build a handsome house on the south side of Baraboo in 1883. The effects of the railroad on Baraboo's growth can hardly be overstated. With connections to broader markets, goods from Baraboo could more easily be shipped out, and goods could be brought into Baraboo much more easily from other places. The residents of Baraboo could also get more easily to many far-off places, and excursions to places like Madison were soon established. About a month after the arrival of the railroad in Baraboo, in the fall of 1871, news reached the community that the city of Chicago had been decimated by a giant fire. The summer and fall had been extremely dry in the Midwest, and by December, Baraboo probably thought it had escaped the danger of fire. But on Sunday, December 3, 1871, Baraboo's luck ran out. The paper would later report, At half past 12 o'clock on Sunday, smoke was discovered issuing from the roof of the store of Messrs. Bauer, Obert, and Company on the south side of the public square. An alarm of fire was promptly given. It being but shortly after the churches were dismissed, a large crowd was more speedily congregated. The number increased at every moment until, as the fire extended at every place where help was needed, there were men ready and willing to aid. Women too were there, and by their courage and efforts gave at once a noble example and effective assistance. Even though snow was falling, the fire would eventually grow to consume seven buildings and threaten the bank on the corner as it wrapped around from 3rd Ave to Oak Street. Fortunately, the bank building was spared, and in the years following the fire, new brick buildings were built on the south side of the square, some of which are still in use today. This picture from around 1872 is the oldest known picture of the square. In the center is the brick courthouse, and behind the flagpole on the other side of the square looking northwest is the Wisconsin House. In 1872, Baraboo was visited by perhaps its most notable visitor to date when Mary Todd Lincoln spent a night downtown after visiting Devil's Lake. Just a few months after Mary Todd Lincoln's visit to Baraboo, downtown was once again visited by fire in November of 1872. The paper described the scene. Every effort was immediately put forth by those present to save such property as they could and to prevent the further spread of the flames. But little time was allowed even for that. The great danger and fear was that the Western Hotel opposite would ignite from the intense heat and convey the fire to the business houses on the east side of the square. But by almost superhuman effort, this latter calamity was avoided and the flames were confined to the block above named. The fire once again cleared the way for new brick buildings on 4th Street, including one for Henry Muller, uncle of the Ringling Brothers, who had a carriage factory. In 
William Canfield, Sauk County's first historian and surveyor, produced this map of Baraboo in 1872 showing the extent of the city and included the railroad yards on the south side and effigy and conical mounds that still existed throughout the city. In 1875, a new covered wooden bridge was built at the Ash Walnut Street location by Jerry Dodd. Jerry Dodd built several covered bridges in Sauk County in the 1870s, including the one in Baraboo, which was the largest at over 160 feet long. It included a central walkway for horse and carriage, as well as pedestrian walkways on the outside of the bridge. All of Sauk County's wooden bridges are now gone, but the last remaining wooden covered bridge in Wisconsin in situ is located in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. This bridge undoubtedly was built by Jerry Dodd. Hotel accommodations in Baraboo were much improved in 1878 when Charles Sumner finished a new stone building on the northwest corner of Fourth and Oak, housing his mercantile and 14 hotel rooms. The building was finished just in time to witness Baraboo's largest fire to date happen just across the street. That fall, the newspaper reported, On November 6, 1878, between 7 and 8 o'clock this morning, a fire broke out on Oak Street between 3rd and 4th in the business plot occupying the east side of the public square. The fire originated under the roof and about the chimney in Sumner's building. A carpenter had built a fire in a large stove on the first floor, he being about to make repairs upon the building. It originated in the middle of the block in a building owned by Charles Sumner, and a few minutes after it was discovered, broke out at the roof, and then, for want of fire apparatus, became unmanageable. The wind conveyed the flames southerly to other buildings in the block, and the heat was so intense as to cause the fire to back up against the wind and take out the buildings to the north. Van Steele's Bakery, next north of Sumner's building, was the second to take fire, and Gattaker's building across the alley to the south, third. The Western Hotel, occupying the north end of the block, took hold from Van Steele's. Once again, brick buildings would replace those lost by fire. As Baraboo grew, municipal amenities like public street lamps came to be seen in different parts of the city. In 1928, Ruth Southard wrote about growing up in Baraboo. How well I remember when there were no street lamps in Baraboo. Looking backward, it doesn't seem so very long ago when pedestrians carried lanterns to light themselves about, small fancy ones for women, sturdy, square, or round, or three-sided ones for men, lighted at first by tallow candles, later by kerosene oil. All along the road, what could see these firefly lights carried by headless creatures, for the upper part of the body was in shadow. Like will-o'-the-wisps, lantern light bobbed here and there, and wherever there was work to do after dark, it was rather weird and unreal. On winter nights, when the road was the only thoroughfare, when the snow was drifted high over the fence tops, one trudged along behind the little beam of lantern light to church or to the neighbors. Sleigh bells, singly or in groups, or whole strings of them, gave warning of approaching teams, allowing one to step aside till the road was clear again. Whoever has heard sleigh bells on a still winter's night will never forget them. In 1882, Baraboo was incorporated as a city under Chapter 21 of the Laws of Wisconsin, 1882, approved on February 25th. On March 14th, C.A. Swineford was elected as Baraboo's first mayor, and the first meeting of the Common Council was held on March 28th, 1882. The following year, George Ruland expanded his brewery and built a new brick building at the northwest corner of Walnut and Lynn Streets on Baraboo's south side. Besides housing the brewery, the building also contained a saloon.
Just down the street, Ferdinand Effinger built a new facility for his brewery, which he had started around 1881. In 1885, he constructed a new brick building, which contained a saloon, barley room, malt room, malt cellar, grinding mill, malt kiln, and two beer kettles, as well as the residence for himself and his family. Back on the square, the Sumner House was substantially enlarged in 1884 by its new owner, Mayor Thompson M. Warren. A 34 by 70 foot addition was added to the north and the whole building was covered with a mansard roof creating a third story. The new enlarged building contained 55 sleeping rooms, parlors, dining rooms, and modern conveniences including a three-story water closet connected to each floor with a covered walk. By 1884, the brick courthouse in the center of the square was too small for the growing county government and it was decided to enlarge the building. An addition was added to the west end of the building, two stories in height, complete with basement, so for the first time there were indoor toilets inside of the courthouse. The addition was topped with a gabled roof and a porthole window decorating the gable end. The following year, a new roof was put on the older portion of the courthouse, but by order of the county board, it could not be any higher than the roof on the addition. Since the older portion was wider, a rather unusual shaped roof was the result. Just a few blocks from the courthouse on May 19, 1884, five of the seven Ringling brothers held their first tented circus performance in Baraboo. The brothers had started a vaudeville hall show in 1882. The Ringling Brothers' first circus tent was pitched just north of the old stone hexagonal jail on the southwest corner of 2nd and Broadway. The big top was 49 by 90 feet, and a section of homemade bleachers collapsed during the show, but no one was seriously hurt. The Ringlings first moved to Baraboo in the fall of 1854 when August Ringling and his wife, Salome Juliar Ringling, moved from Milwaukee with their two infant boys. Ads in the Baraboo newspapers of the time show that August Ringling was a harness maker. By 1859, August Ringling was struggling and added groceries to his harness and saddle business. The family left Baraboo in 1860. August Ringling moved his family to the Prairie de Sheen area and then eventually across the Mississippi River to McGregor, Iowa, where several more Ringling children were born. The Ringling family moved back to Baraboo in 1875, and this picture shows August and Salome Ringling with their five oldest boys, Al, August Jr. or Gus, Otto, Alf T., and Charles. August Ringling once again established his harness making and carriage trimming business in Baraboo, but left just a few years later again in 1883. The oldest Ringling son, Al Ringling, remained in Baraboo where he eventually met Eliza Morris, who often went by the name Lou. The couple was reportedly married December 19, 1883, as recounted in this letter from Lou to her new in-laws the following year. Lou Ringling was instrumental in getting the Ringling Brothers Circus established, doing just as much as her husband and his brothers. In the early years, Lou performed as a snake charmer, drove a wagon team when needed, and helped manage wardrobe and other female employees. 
for the first six years the ringling brothers circus was a horse-drawn wagon show but in eighteen ninety they converted to rail which made traveling much easier each fall the circus would return to baraboo and a winter headquarters was established on water street next to the river where equipment and animals were housed for the winter as the ringling brothers circus grew scenes like this one became commonplace as elephants were exercised by walking the baraboo streets by the time the ringling brothers started their circus in 1884 baraboo had grown substantially from this view done in 1870 the year before the railroad arrived In 1886, a new bird's eye drawing for Baraboo was done, showing how the town had grown substantially in the 15 years from the last bird's eye drawing. The 1886 bird's eye drawings highlighted the rail yard at the bottom of the image, showcasing the roundhouse, which would eventually grow to 28 stalls. On the left side of the drawing, the island woolen mill is shown at the upper oxbow, as well as another covered wooden bridge along 2nd Avenue. Downtown, numerous brick buildings now surround three sides of the public square and the old brick courthouse in the middle. Just a block away is the 1869 public schoolhouse. Thank you for joining us for Baraboo 101 Part 3 from Railroad to Ringling.